bike fitting, science or art or somewhere in between. That's what we're going to try and cover today. This is the bike fitting corner of Mapdeck Cycle Works. I want to show you around what we do here, our philosophy, our approach, why we've done this. But then I also want to go through to the office and sit down and talk through some of the broader approaches to bike fitting as well. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a better understanding of what you need to look for in the bike fitter that's got the skills that you need. You see, it's such a massive multidisciplinary approach that very, very few bike fitters have got the complete range of skills that you need. So here's our setup. Um, we keep it fairly basic actually. At some point I did think about getting one of the big jigs. You might have seen them where you sit on it and a, you know motors move you up and down and computers scan you and all that sort of thing. To me, that's not really where our clients come from. Most of our clients come with a bike that they particularly just want fine tuned to their fit or maybe they've got a bike that they're not quite happy with considering buying a new bike. So we've always nearly always got a basis to start from uh, and also we have the geometry needs to start from as well and that's really important to me as a bike geek that we're not just fitting biomechanics but we also need to fit the whole you know what do you actually need your bike to do because biomechanics or not how you fit a 130 millimeter trail bike to an aero road bike is completely different and there's many many people that have both of those types of bikes in their cycling stable you can't just apply one fit to the other so i believe that bike fitting is dependent on the actual discipline as much as the actual rider so that's why we tend to use uh, the tax neo turbo trainer it's super versatile it's a really stable platform and you can get every single bike on there i've had very very few issues with um, getting a rider set up on a tax neo turbo trainer it also transmits power, uh, which is what we see on the screen, on the big black screen you can see here, we use a bit of software called Perf Pro. Um, when bike fitting, I only really use power just to help an athlete keep a consistent cadence. I think when you're in a bike fitting studio, it's very easy to just switch your mind off and all of a sudden your, your pedaling cadence will become slow or faster, or you might start pedaling easy or hard. So I think it's important for consistency when you make a change that you also make sure you're putting out roughly the same amount of power each time um, or you're doing a similar sort of pedaling cadence just so that we know we've got that extra feedback because sometimes in the discussion you can just, you can just lose sight of that. Um, so the other thing we use is uh, a nice video camera down here. Camcorders work really well, way better than DSLRs. This one um, comes out high definition at 50 frames per second. Uh, autofocus on it is great. Um, it just takes care of stuff and that is linked up to a capture card that goes to the computer you can see and we use a bit of software called Kinevera. Uh, Kinevera is a fantastic, it's actually um, freeware or open source software and you can draw all over stuff. So you can like draw um, angles and lines and skeletal shapes and grids and all that sort of stuff and you can put like markers on your, on your rider and that way you can track where the knee is moving through that time and with a big video light and 50 frames per second you can normally get a really nice accurate idea of what's going on it's way easier than using your eyes because everything's at like the eye level you can set the camera up at the angle that you want and get everything nice and straight so that's our setup we also use laser levels a lot so we have a whole bunch of like laser levels. This is from a, a builder's yard and they turn these on and they draw like a nice straight line on the wall. Um, and this is really good for tracking knee angles and you know, four and a half positions and that sort of thing. So we have one of these set up permanently looking sideways and they have one that I move around from the front and to the back of the athlete, depending on what we're looking for at that time. And then we have a whole bunch of other tools as well. So have uh, a stem sizer made by a company called Bike Fit. So we, use one of these we take your stem off and replace it with this and this just gives us the ability to you know move your handlebars up down in and out really really easily without having you having to jump off the bike every time and once we've got this set up we can make small changes and just get ballpark and then think about a more permanent solution once we're sort of happy that we've tried lots of variables um, a really simple tool is just um, <laughs> a plank of wood and a, a digital level and we use this for uh, saddle tilt really so lots of saddles now have lots of really elaborate sort of shapes and curves in them and it's quite hard to keep track of exactly which part you're measuring the saddle tilt from so tend to use this plank of wood and don't worry too much about what the number is this is more to track 
how many degrees were going down. Sometimes they might only be making a half a degree at a time. So it's just a nice way of just fine tuning and finding that half a degree difference and always having this in a sort of a consistent place. Actual saddle tilt is hard to know exactly or hard to explain on a video exactly where you would measure saddle tilt from. So it's uh, this plank of wood and the laser level is really helpful for consistency. Things like <clears throat> pedal spaces as well, just to change Q angles and Q factor, sorry, and all that sort of thing. So, so of course the, the biggest tool we haven't actually talked about is actually just the, the skills of the bike fitter and the communication that has to go on because it's, you're trying to talk in terminology that is probably alien to the rider and you're trying to get their feedback without telling them what it is that you want to hear. And this is actually a really tricky art to do is to try and elicit the sort of language and helpful feedback you need without planting ideas of what they maybe should be feeling. Uh, this is definitely how I think most bike fits go is to try and get that communication going. Obviously from experience as you've been just watching lots and lots of bike fits and doing them, you almost instantly pick up on things like hip flexibility and, and everything else. Talking of which, uh, a typical bike fit from us will normally involve uh, a quick consultation. We don't like to stand around for too long. You know, what are the problems that you're encountering so far? What do you hope to get from your bike fit? We'll do a very quick sort of mobility examination, a quick Q&A about some stuff, and we'll talk through how your fit is at the moment, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. And we'll very quickly get you on the bike and get loads of video footage. We need to do a good warm up, And <laughs> a little trick I like to do is just to try and leave the video camera running and just walk out the room because I think anybody when they're being watched by a bike fitter will instantly have a good posture because you know how you should be but by leaving the room for a second we can start to see athletes just adopt their normal position which is normally a lot more slouched and that's what we're trying to pick up on and then we'll build from there we'll get the rider off we'll talk through the changes that I'd like to make and as we make those changes towards what's a good biomechanic fit then we start to encounter compromises between a rider's flexibility or possible injuries and then to try and find the best biomechanical performance and comfort fit around any limitations that the rider has. And after that, it's like a, a trial and error of, of things if you like to try and get us dialed in. And of course, saddle is an important part because it's all very well sat in here on a, doing a bike fit. But I tell you, as soon as you spent an hour in that position or two hours, it can be very, very, very different. So I really like to keep the door open to say, you know, you've got to go out there now and spend some time in this position and come back to me and tell me how you got on. And if we need to make small adjustments, we'll make small adjustments. And I think it's really important that the client always feels welcome to come back for adjustments because any of us can sit in a really good, strong position, engage our core and hold a nice posture for a few minutes while you're on the turbo trainer it's a very, very different story when you're fatigued and tired and halfway into a ride. So there we go. That's sort of my philosophy. I'm going to go through to the office now and we're going to talk through the big <laughs> spectrum of bike fit and see where we go. Okay, let's see how many people I can upset with this presentation. Now, I just want to get into the, the big picture. So here's a little presentation I've put together. Here's what I think are the major five things that make up a bike fit. I'll come to the, like the graph in a second. And that is a good understanding of the musculoskeletal system, the muscles, the skeleton, the biomechanics, how muscles function together, chain of movement, posture, all that sort of thing. Bike geometry, I think is super important because everything you change as a bike fitter is going to have some sort of implication on how a bike is going to handle. And not so much that the bike is going to handle a different way, but also that might actually relate to the uh, athlete having to do more steering corrections or sit in a, a way that affects the handling, which then could actually lead to greater fatigue or actually could actually improve the handling significantly. So the changes you make could actually make the bike easier to handle and therefore relieve some muscular fatigue from them. So I think a good understanding of what you're actually doing to the bike and its geometry is really important. Bike mechanics. <laughs> I've put this in because there are sadly quite a lot of physiotherapists and sports therapists who have been trained. You can actually go on a course to do bike fitting and 
although they can do a very good biomechanical fit, the, some of the bikes that have come out of that have been hideously unsafe. We're talking like compression bungs that have been wound out, um, headsets which have come back loose, handlebars which are either over tightened and just I really still think if you're going to be messing around with bolts and parts on a bike, you need to make sure that bike goes back together safely. Um, big, big warning if you're definitely going down that route is to maybe go to a bike shop and just say, hey, I've had a bike fit from a sports therapist or physio. Would you mind just checking it for safety? Uh, I would definitely try and do that. Injury rehab is quite often why people come to, for a bike fit because they're suddenly, they've had an injury, a knee operation or whatever it is, and they want to get back on their bikes and just need to try and tweak their fit to a place where they can actually do some sort of exercise. And finally, aerodynamics um, is probably why a lot of time trialists and triathletes go and get a bike fit is to try and dial in that body position, get that frontal area down, get that head, you know, tucked in and that sort of thing. So, um, when you've got this idea in mind, you can start plotting who you are as a bike fitter, if you're a bike shop watching this, or what it is that you want from your bike fitter and make sure you're going into that appointment with this sort of knowledge. So I've put on here like where I think my skills are. And I think it's important to notice that my skills go so far, but I need to know where to look for further help. So in terms of muscular skeleto, I put myself quite low, but we have a team of five sports therapists that work upstairs, right the way up to level five sports therapists. And we've got very, very good ties with local physiotherapists who can take the next stage. Quick side note, actually, if you're wondering what the difference between a physiotherapist and a sports therapist is, because it's a common misconception, a physiotherapist is definitely someone who's gone to university, has got the medical side of that qualification, and they can actually give a proper diagnosis a sports therapist, uh, more likely the people who are going to get hands on and actually deliver the actual therapy. So physiotherapist might give you a diagnosis and give you a sheet of paper to go away and do some exercises to help it. But a therapist might do the sports massage and might actually help you with those actual activities. So there's a little distinction there. As always, just like doctors and nurses, there's a very, very highly experienced sports therapist out there um, who do most of the work of um, a physiotherapist but sometimes can't actually give the diagnosis so again if that's a thing just you know just uh, check what you're looking for um bike geometry for me and bike mechanics i think is high on that list that's definitely where i come from and then injury rehab again i've got a little bit of experience here but really i pull on the team here to help me with those sort of things and if i've got someone coming in where we normally triage them and say, okay, I'm going to need some help from someone else with your problem. So let's make sure we book an appointment where I can get that help here when you're here as well. Um, aerodynamics, I have to say, this is a massive gap in our knowledge. We, it's not something that I know much about. It's not something I'm that interested in. I've got a little bit of understanding uh, to help sort of novice triathletes and time trialists get to a position where they can actually pedal a bike in that position we've had some success in this but i definitely wouldn't put it up as my expertise that's for sure but i do know other bike fitters in the area who can do that um who then sometimes suffer some of the other things and we've definitely seen people go and get a very very aerodynamic fit but then they've used sort of 3d printed wedges um and like some crazy stuff which just isn't safe and we have definitely seen people out on the racetrack have accidents because parts of their handlebar system have collapsed because it was just unsafe so you still need to have it, it might be a great error position but if you can't go around a roundabout or a corner on your time trial bike without your handlebars collapsing collapsing it'll be it's pretty pointless so have that in mind when you're uh, when you're going for a bike fit you know what it is that you're trying to get from your fit and are is the person who's delivering the bike fit able to deliver um, what you want so um, I want to talk about this guy quickly. This is uh, Phil Burt. He is probably about the authority on bike fitting at the moment. And he's got a couple of books out. And he talks about the three pillars of fit. And on here, you can imagine that the choice between aero, comfort and power output depends very much on what it is that you're trying to achieve. So if you are a time trialist, then 
aerodynamics and power are very, very important, way more important than comfort because you don't tend to be on the bike for that long. If you are a sportive rider, then aero and comfort and power, those dynamics are a bit more muddled and maybe you want to prioritize comfort depending on your own personal uh, personal taste. But he goes on, and this is where my opinion <laughs> sort of very much aligns to Phil's really. And he talks about the idea of micro adjusters and macro absorbers. And the idea is if you're a micro adjuster, you're the type of person who needs your bike fit to be absolutely dialed in. It needs to be millimeter perfect for you to be able to perform. If you're a macro absorber, you're the sort of person that can just pick a bike off the shelf, get it roughly the right size, quick inside leg measurement, jump on, get on with it, not too worried. Phil goes on in his little quote in his book that says, I'm often asked how important optimizing bike fit is. My honest answer is, to some, very, to others, not so much. This is definitely where my experience is. Some people can come in for a bike fit, haven't been told to go for a bike fit. It's really important to get a bike fit. And we don't really change very much. And if we do, they can't really tell the difference. They're sort of a bit like, can't really tell if that was better or not. To others, you can change the handlebar height by three millimeters and you think you've completely changed their world. Um, he goes on and says, I doubt you will ever hear that from any commercial fitter, but it's my opinion and here's why. And he is so right in that. The commercial bike fit is, it's got a bit out of hand in my opinion. There's so much science and smoke, smoke and mirrors going on and it's sort of all hyped up and you go through this big body screening and there's, you know, like I just tons and tons of stuff going on and not everybody needs that. In fact, I'd say very, very few people actually need that. Um, he goes on and talks more about this micro adjusters and the micro adjusters being very injury prone. And you can kind of see what's been going on with the pro riders in this. So the injury prone riders, he sort of cites Eddie Merckx as being the great <laughs> micro adjusters, always just changing something. Uh, he talks about Ben Swift as well and a few other athletes. Um, but how the pro teams are now trying to steer their athletes towards being a much more of a macro absorber. So you might remember Team Sky quite famously had um, stem lengths in like one millimeter increment to try and get those marginal gains. And actually now you're starting to see pro teams um, get their athletes into doing yoga and Pilates and strength training to become much more of a macro absorber so they can they have to jump onto a neutral service bike and get going that they can do. But they also find that they're much more of a highly robust athlete, that they're less likely to be injured. They're much more likely to perform across a range of different races and just be ready to go. Uh, and that's what they're trying to develop. And this is definitely where a lot of our bike fits go, if I'm honest. A lot of our bike fits tend to become a bit of a red flag, a bit of a warning sign that says, you know, your bike fit actually... You know, we can keep raising your handlebars and, you know, trying to open up your hips and all that sort of stuff and relieve pain. But fundamentally, at some point, you are going to have to work on your flexibility, your mobility, your strength, because otherwise you're going to become much, much more of a micro adjuster and less of a macro absorber. And that is that is fundamentally way more important then getting a bike fit after bike fit after bike fit and get every single one of the bikes in your stable exactly the right size is to work on your flexibility. Because I hate to say it, as you get older, if you don't work on it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you'll be constantly back at your bike fitter, getting things changed, getting things adapted. Whereas actually, sometimes the bike fitter needs to say, stop, just you need to go and work on your body you know, rather than just throwing money at new saddles and new bike fits and different geometry, go and spend some time becoming a macro absorber. It'll be much more beneficial to you. So yeah, here, oh, <laughs> here, is, uh, here is my sort of conclusion, if you like. Magic beans or vital service. <laughs> and I think this very much depends on whether you were that micro adjuster or macro absorber coming into a bike fit, if you're a micro adjuster, you are going to find a bike fit, the most vital thing that you've ever done. And if you weren't, you're probably going, what the hell did I just spend my money on? And we have definitely had situations where, like I say, our 
change someone's saddle height by three millimeters and it's completely changed their world and other people who I can change tons of stuff and they're like do you know what feels about the same <laughs> um, and sometimes you just have to be uh, really really honest with that okay as always the most educational part of these videos seems to be the comments below so get type in I definitely want to hear from you if you have had a bike fit, especially from something really elaborate like the retool system. How did you get on with it? Did it change your world or did it leave you feeling a bit, you know, and are you still riding that fit? You know, how did you get on with it? Does this relate to your experience? Is it completely different? Because I say you guys are out there, you've got the other side, if you like, you've got that feedback that we are asking for days, weeks, months, years after the event. So get down in the comments, please share your experiences. Let me know how it goes. And I hope this was useful to you. Um, and if it was, we'll see you tomorrow on the next make as much cycling content as we can while the World Cup is on. Until then, have a great weekend and take it easy.